I want to talk to you today about victory together. Victory together. Because I know this. I don't stand here because I did it all myself. I mean, uh, there's a sister Nugent who prayed over my life. Was there when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Was there when I got called into ministry. Was cheering me on. And praying for me. There's a Connie Hart in Gibsonville, North Carolina that calls me every now and then. Pastor Larry, Pastor Larry, you kept me up all night last night. What's going on? See, nobody in the kingdom of God gets somewhere by yourself. And uh, I want to talk to you today about victory together. There's this story in Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 and 8 through 13, we're going to read. While the people of Israel were still at Rephidim, the warrior of Amalek attacked them. Moses commanded Joshua, choose some men to go out and fight the army of Amalek for us. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill holding the staff of God in my hand. I want you just just... Bear with me just for a minute. I want you to know the, the, the hill is not named. And, and sometimes we are, we are very guilty about trying to figure out where, what, when. And sometimes the place is not as important as what happened. And that's what we need to centralize on today. In verse 10. So Joshua did what Moses had commanded him and fought the army of Amalek. Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur climbed to the top of the nearby hill. And as long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hands, the Amalekites gained the advantage. Moses' arms soon became so tired, he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on, and they stood on each side of Moses, holding up his hands. So his hands held steady until sunset. As a result, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalek in the battle. Lord, in the next few moments, speak to our hearts and our lives. In the next few moments, captivate us with your word. May your truth, Help us. God, we need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is a battle. This is a battle that requires victory. Can I tell you, you're in a battle that requires a victory. Uh, uh, I'm in a I'm, I, I'm contending that the battle we fight demands a victory. Uh, victory is no, to, to be in defeat is not an option. We've got to have victory. So God had made a promise to Abraham that his seed would, it, would have the land. And, and, and here we are some hundreds of years later, after 400 years of slavery, God sends Moses to go capture what God has promised. And what God has promised required a battle. You, you sometimes, I don't know about you, but with those gifts underneath the Christmas tree, I've never had to fight anybody for them. I, I've never had to go to war for those presents because people loved me and cared for me. But I'm going to tell you something. The promises of God that he has made for you, made for our church, made for me, made for this staff. If you're going to receive them, they're going to have to be contended for. Because the enemy does not want you to fulfill God's promise or purpose in your life. 
that means you have someone who is contending against your marriage. Who is contending against your sons and your daughters. And you are going to have to fight a battle. But don't fight it alone. If there's anything this passage of Scripture is telling us is this. Victory is obtained when there are many people engaged. There is a spiritual battle in the promised land. Joshua, you don't have enough military might to fight the battle to accomplish what God wants to do in giving the children of God the promise he made. Some things cometh not but by prayer and fasting. Sometimes we're guilty of knowing how to do it. Coming up with an international, you know, an intellectual scheme. I know, I know, I know. I don't know about you, but I can imagine them standing before a Red Sea, not knowing. What are we going to do now? When your road becomes a dead end, it's the God of heaven who knows how to part waters. And that's what God is trying to teach the children of God. If you're going to obtain what I have promised for your marriage, for your children, and for your life, it is going to be because there are people around you who know how to hold up your arms in prayer and sacrifice. That's what I know. The enemy does not want you to inherit the promise of God. He does not want you to inherit that promise. I just want to remind you, sometimes promises come in dreams. Some of you have a God birth dream in your heart, and you think, it sure doesn't sound very spiritual to me, but can I tell you? I don't think Joshua's dream sounded too spiritual, so spiritual for his brother's. When he said, you guys are going to bow to me, it didn't sound very spiritual. But I'm going to tell you, it was spiritual in preservation of God's people and promise. So don't you dismay or diminish the promise, the dream God has in your life. Well, I I dream of a better job. Well, then keep dreaming because maybe that's God's promise. Well, I dream of doing this in work and we'll keep dreaming because maybe that's God's fruition, the seed of the thing he wants to birth out of your life. Don't stop dreaming your dream. Don't do it. God raised up Moses to take the children of Israel into the promised land. Thus, there would be many battles, spiritual battles, fleshly battles people his own people would be in opposition to him i think of all the people in scripture moses is the best pastor because i know at one time he's ready to hang them all because they're contending they're they want to go backwards instead of forwards they what they want to you know they're dreaming about where they've been instead of where they're going into God's promise. And you can, I'm going to tell you as a believer, it's easy to get content instead of go. And and Moses is just faithful and he prays and he keeps going to the mountain and he keeps contending in the presence of God. It's a beautiful thing that he doesn't give up. And I tell you, there's not one battle in your future. There's many. If you're going to have the marriage God wants you to have, you're going to have to fight for it. <laughs> you know, we have this happily ever after. Whoops. It doesn't work that way. I mean, I mean, I, Linda and I have had to contend. And sometimes she's had to contend with me. That was a joke. It's not going to be hard. I can be difficult. 
you know? Not Linda. She's too sweet. Eh. We're human. Now, God refines you in the process of marriage. But I'm going to tell you something. It gets better. Don't give up on God's promise. Don't give up. Hmm. This is what I know. We can't fight the battles alone. Did you hear me? That's why God gave us a church. We don't fight alone. We fight with somebody on our side. Joshua was on the battlefield because Joshua was obedient and Moses told him to go down there. And Moses said, I'm going to the hill. I'm going to the prayer mountain. You better have somebody praying for you. And, and I don't know. I, I meet these Christians all the time. Can I pray about it? No, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> what we're really afraid to say is, I'm in trouble. My kids are in trouble and I need your help. Can you pray? If you'll humble yourself, you'll find a Moses and an Aaron and a an her that'll pray and intercede in the midst of the battle. That's hard to do, though, because we want to be self-sufficient, spiritually mature in our aloneness. Help us, Lord. Because when you're in the battle, extra help is needed. If you're going to obtain what God has promised for you, extra help is needed. And for Joshua on the battlefield and the children of Israel on the battlefield down there fighting the Amalekites, they need a little extra help. And there was Moses. Aren't you glad for Moses? Who stand on the mountain and pray with a staff, with authority of heaven, surrendered to God and surrendered in victory for the people of God. But even Moses is get tired. Moses can't contend by himself for the people of God. He's got to have an Aaron and a her. And thank God for the staff that I have who have been there for me. Holding my hands up. Why? Because the promise of God is at stake in your lives. Amen. Psalm 64, it's 63, verse 4, it says this. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. Oh, it's a place of surrender. God brought the victory on the battlefield because there were three men on top of a mountain who would not give up. The promise of God need to be cont contended for. Paul said... And he declares, ministry is a fight. <laughs> I have fought. The good. You know what that means? Fight comes with stress. Conflict. People don't always get along. You just read. Read what Moses had to put up with. We want some water. We want some meat. Man, I mean, amazing things happen. But were the people of God content? Whew. Who won that battle that day? Joshua in the battle. No, Joshua didn't win that battle. Moses. No, Moses didn't win that battle. Aaron and Hur. No, they didn't. They all won the battle because they were all engaged in making sure that heaven was on their side, that the God of victory was the one fighting the battle in their stead. And when God fights, you win. You win. Exodus chapter 15, verse 3. The Lord is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. Listen, uh, Zechariah saw the Lord coming, and, and Zechariah says this about the Lord. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he has fought in times past. 
glory to God. You should know that God has fought for you. You should know that the one enthroned in heaven has fought for your life to make sure the promise he has made to you is going to come to pass. What is he doing? Ever interceding for you. Do you remember Peter? Peter was in the midst of that. And Jesus looks at him and said, Satan has desired you, but I have prayed for you. Glory to God, the God of heaven who sits enthroned at the right hand has prayed for me. Glory to God. Why? Because there's a promise yet to be fulfilled that God is going to do in my life, in our lives, in your life. He is contending in heaven right now for us. He's fought in the past. He'll fight now. He'll fight in the future. Matthew 16, 18. Peter made this confession about who Jesus was. And Jesus says, and now I say unto you, Peter, which means rock, upon this rock I will build my church and the powers of hell will not conquer it. You know what that means? They're going to try. It means they're going to come against you. It means there's going to be all kinds of roadblocks. But do not lose heart. Because I, Jesus said, I am going to build my church. You know what that means? Victory for you, for us. Amen? If you're going to win the battle, there are some physical things that need to be done. Physical things like putting men in the battlefield. There's some physical things that need to be, like holding up somebody's arms. The problem with us is, we say, oh, it's just old trivial things. I want to remind you that holding up somebody's arms won the battle. Sometimes we're so guilty of allowing these little things to become, eh, it doesn't really matter if I show up on time or not. I mean, I shouldn't have said that, should I? Spiritual things that have ho obtained victory in Scripture. Prayer. It seems so simple. I mean, think about it. You're just communicating to heaven. You're having a conversation with heaven. And, and it pulls down strongholds. It seems so insignificant. The fast. Fast. Pastor Larry, do you have to talk about fasting right now because I'm hungry? You should make it a regular habit to fast. There's three things that the pastor talks about where he gets real quiet. And one of them is fasting. I won't mention the other two now. Matt, Jesus said this when they, he was led into the spirit, uh, by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. I like that word, very hungry, because I think it's an understatement. You're not just hungry. After 40 days, you're very hungry. Because it seems insignificant to push breakfast aside. But heaven pays attention. Giving. Can I tell you, God wants to, God does powerful things through obedience of giving. First Kings chapter 17, there's a story. Elijah said unto her, don't be afraid. I mean, she was out of all of her resources. She had just a little bit of bread and fl uh, flour and oil. She was going to make a bread. They were going to eat it and die. I, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty desperate to me. Huh? But Elijah said, her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and just do what you have said, but make a little f bread for me first. And when you use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, 
There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So when she did, as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days, there was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers just as the Lord promised through Elijah. But if you're not given, you cease the flow. Malachi chapter 3. Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask how? By what means? When you, when did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me with tithes and offerings. Do me. You are under a curse for the whole nation has been cheating me. Verse 10, bring all your tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple if you do says the Lord of heaven's armies. I will open up the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough to take it in. Put me to test. Your crops will be abundant. For I will guard them from insect Insects and disease. You know what he's really saying here? I'm going I'm to protect your retirement. Your grapes will not fall from your vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's ar- armies. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for the land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Notice the protection. It's a spiritual. It sets up a spiritual blessing and a spiritual hedge of protection. The blessings of provision and the hedge of protection against the stuff that's going on in the world. The insects and all that other stuff. God knows how to protect you. Prayer, fasting, giving, obedience. Just being obedient. Can you imagine that? They, God says, Jesus says after the resurrection, hey, why don't you just go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit? That is 10 days after he is resurrected. He'd been hung out with them, and then he, he told them 40 days they're in this room. Can you imagine 40 days in the room with the sons of thunder? 40 days in a room with Peter running his mouth. Telling you what he's going to do, how brave, and I'm just joking. I want to tell you, they obeyed God. And when they obeyed God, heaven opened up over them. When they obeyed God, the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they turned the world upside down. The Holy Spirit didn't come first without obedience. And the simple thing of confession is a power, powerful instrument in defeating the enemy. Huh? Confession. Forgive me, Lord. I, I remember the time I had to ask Ben to forgive me because Micah got him in trouble and I disciplined Micah, I mean Ben, and really should have been Micah getting the discipline. Do you ever apologize to your kids because you? I confessed. They know already you're not perfect. I'm going to say that again. (laughs) They already know you're not perfect. A touch. Remember that lady? I had to press through the crowd just to touch the hem of a garment. And what happened? The power of God. The battle was won. Don't you wipe out the little things. Don't think that when God whispers in your ear it's insignificant. Because I'm telling you, the enemy wants you to reduce those little things to insignificance. So that he can reduce you to insignificance. And think you're not counting in the kingdom of God. But I'm going to tell you right now. There is a God in heaven who has a promise for you and for us. That if you just reduce yourself to insignificance. You'll just drudge along in your convenience. But I want you to know God has a few 
few battles that you're supposed to be engaged in to bring defeat to the enemy and to bring victory to your family, to your house, to this church, and we have to be engaged. Faith. Think about it. Just a little faith. I'm always amazed at the little boy who gave up his lunch. It seems so insignificant. Matter of fact, one of the disciples says, what is that among so many? <laughs> With God, it's enough. A vision, a dream, endurance, steadfastness, surrender, worship. Remember Paul and Silas? They're thrown in jail and midnight they decide to worship God. I don't know about you, but I'd be struggling to worship God in the midst of other men's feces and urine and the stench of that jail. And the worship. Loose them. There's power. Repentance, the word of God, the revelation, kindness, love. Can I tell you little things matter? That's why you should smile. You should never know what that little encouragement would do to somebody. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 and 12, it says, But you, Timothy, are a man of God. Sometimes I read the scripture in my name. I want you to put your name in there. Would you do that right now? But you, Larry. You, some of you are going to need to change that man to woman of God. <laughs> but you, Larry, are a man of God. So run from these evil things. Pursue righteousness and a godly life along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. They seem so insignificant. They seem so tiny. Fight! The good fight of faith. For the, for the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life which God has called you, which you have declared so well before many witnesses. Stand. Why don't you bow your head? Some of you in this room are fighting for your marriage. Some of you in this room are fighting for your children. Some of you are fighting for a promotion. Some of you are fighting for something in your life. And I'm here to tell you not to give up. I don't care how discouraged you are or how it looks. There is a God in heaven who is ready to come to your aid to fight in your behalf for his promise to come to pass in your life. For your marriage, for your children, for your work. Don't give up on that dream he gave you. Well, pastor, the odds are against me to ever do. Don't you ever forget. Don't you ever forget. You know, I watched Kurt Warner's story the other day. He had this dream to play in the Super Bowl, and he was bagging groceries. Guess where he ended up? with a Super Bowl ring on his finger. Can I tell you something? And he stood there giving all glory and praise to God who made it happen. It's just a football game. Can I tell you God is interested in your dreams? We're going to worship the Lord right now and if there's something you're battling, something that you are contending for in your life and you need a little... Aaron and her by your side. 
I invite you to just come and stand before the Lord and allow him to just to help you. Because he is a very present help in the time of need. And there's one thing God does not want you to do is quit. Give up. Surrender. It is a fight worth fighting for. That's you today. Would you just come and stand before him? Surrender to him. God, I need your help.